Tonight on The Conscious Resistance, we go over a new report from the Human Rights Watch that details the American government's use of informants when catching so-called terrorists. Jeremy Scahill and The Intercept release a new document detailing how the government places you on terrorism and no-fly lists. Victory for activists and community members fighting Detroit water shutoffs. Take a look at flotation devices and how they might help you with your PTSD. All this and more tonight on The Conscious Resistance Network. On Monday, Human Rights Watch released a new report detailing the American government's use of informants and the sketchy means that they use to label people terrorists and to continue the propped up war on terror. Now, the new report, it's backing up what we've known for the past couple years. Even a few years back, the New York Times wrote an article detailing how most terror plots in the United States are actually hatched and brought forth by the FBI and various other institutions of the federal government. This new report, however, comes from an even more credible organization, Human Rights Watch, who has released a, a report entitled Illusion of Justice, Human Rights Abuses and U U.S. Terrorism Prosecutions. Now, if you've paid attention to how the war on terror has been won in the United States and the shady circumstances under which an individual can be labeled a terrorist and then brought to court and tried as a terrorist, then this might not be much news to you, but it's also more fuel for us and the fight to help people understand that terrorism and the way it's being applied in the United States is really just a catch-all term that they use to label their enemies. Some of the interesting aspects of this report go into the use of informants and what they found was in at least 30% of the cases, terrorism cases since 9-11 have involved heavy use of informants and the problem with these informants is oftentimes there are other criminals who've been caught in drug cases or you know they've been caught in their own criminal cases and they're told by the FBI, told by the government that you can get out of this if you help us catch a terrorist and so they go and they seek out people and they they try to find them and oftentimes these prosecution and persecution of so-called terrorists can be seen to be driven by the informant's desire to get out of their own crimes. The Deputy Washington Director of Human Rights Watch said, take a closer look at these cases and you realize that many of these people would never have committed a crime if not for the encouraging, pressuring, and sometimes paying them to commit terrorist acts. So law enforcement seeks out individuals and encourages them, pressures them, pays them to seek out other individuals, offer them ammunition, weapons, explosive devices that don't exist, and then they are able to justify their existence and get another arrest in the so-called war on terror. What I think is interesting about this though is I also wrote an article for Ben Swan last week about another report from USA Today that touches on similar topics, but what it's really focusing on in that report is the use of the ATF and their drug sting operations and whether or not those operations focus on minorities. But we see some of the same practices in these instances. With the ATF, they go into minority communities, uh, endangered communities, where they know people are willing to do maybe some crazy things for money. You know, you come into a poor, low-income neighborhood and offering people $1,000 to go rob a supposed drug stash house. The drug stash house doesn't exist. The drugs don't exist. The drug kingpin they think they're robbing doesn't exist. It's just them specifically targeting criminals. They say they're not doing it because of racial, um, anything to do with race, but they're definitely targeting criminals, people who they think are easy targets. Instead of trying to solve other crimes, they're merely creating new crimes. So the same way the ATF does that with drug sting operations to individuals all around the country, the FBI and the other institutions of the federal government continue to do this with the war on terror. And now with this new report from Human Rights Watch, it's given us more ammo in our information war to help people be aware that the war on terror is false, it's a war against the people, and it's a war against intelligence, and it's very dangerous the way this thing is being waged because not only do they have very broad characteristics for what you know deems you as a terrorist, looking at the statistics and looking at the amount of informants that are being involved, we're bordering right on the edge of being of these people being trapped by their own government. We can kind of point to it and say, guys, I think these may be so-called false flag operations being led by the government, but at the very least, the government is widening um, their, their, their toolbox of how to deem someone a terrorist and to continue to jail people under these terrorism crimes. And 
if it, if this report and other studies are any indicator of how these things are going to go, we should expect to see informants and entrapment with terrorism continue to happen unless you spread the word. On Wednesday, Jeremy Scahill and The Intercept released a leaked document from the Counterterrorism Center of the United States federal government, which details the processes by which they put people on so-called terrorism watch lists, including the no-fly list. The rules are pretty ambiguous, vague, broad. They have terms such as uh, reasonable suspicion and dangerous. Uh, you know, for one, the problems that we have here is they have a very broad definition of what it, terrorism is itself, and they also have a vague and a low threshold for what makes you a terrorist. So the definition is so wide, you can drive a truck through it, anybody could basically be deemed a terrorist. You might just be harassed or be held back from your flight, but they never actually tell you uh, that you're on the list. But also, even after you're dead, you can remain on that list, and you can be placed on that list after you die, even if you weren't before, because they say it's a terrorist tactic to use fake old uh, names of people who've passed on as aliases, and you know that's how they get around and fly. And that, that likely would be true. That's a pretty good trick to use aliases of dead people, and I think that we've seen the government do that when it comes to voting, right? Don't dead people vote these days? I think so. But beyond the fear of dead people being terrorists, we have to come to some place to make sense of all this. We can't just continue to push forth and the face of this global war on terror and buy all this propaganda from the government hook, line, and sinker. So being able to look at these documents for the first time is a powerful, powerful tool. So the specific list that they talked about were the terrorist identities, data mart, environment, or tide and the terrorist screening database. And these also feed into the no-fly list. There have been some high-profile cases and instances where two-year-olds have been on the no-fly list and have been patted down and uh, unable to fly, but we've even had high-profile credentialed people who have no connections to terrorism fighting the cases. And again, even in, those, in the courtrooms there, the no-fly list is subject to much secrecy and the people have trouble finding out any information about how they got on the list and how they can get off. So. Thank you to The Intercept and thank you to Jeremy Scahill and everybody there for doing some good journalism and releasing this document, which I think it's 166 pages, um, and I'll post the link in the video below. It's getting more and more difficult to travel in this world, you know? You can't f drive down the road without some road pirate trying to pull you over and tell you were going too fast or you weren't wearing your safety device or you didn't kiss his ass enough and these various things. It's getting harder and harder to fly without having biometric tracking devices and being subject to pat-downs and violation of amendments. It's becoming a difficult world to travel as a free human being. But by bringing light to these uh, to these documents and to the, the processes that they undergo and that they subject us free people to, we can hopefully bring more awareness, encourage people to be critically thinking and to not subject and take this treatment. Because some people out there will say, you know what, well, this is a post 9-11 world we live in. So we have to have the TSA, we have to have pat downs, and we have to have no filers. Dangerous people are out there. And the world isn't perfect. There is dangerous people out there, but dangerous people have always existed. We can't let ourselves be pushed into a place where freedom doesn't exist based on fear. So we've been releasing new videos from my trip, my bike tour, every week here on The Conscious Resistance. And last week we were almost out of Texas. I hitchhiked a little bit from my friends Bob and Shirley. They gave me a ride to the next town and I continued on my way. Now we're nearing the end of my time in Texas. So this next video will catch you up with my last stop here in Texas where I was out of tires, I was getting frustrated, and I ended up hitchhiking and catching my way into El Paso. And from there, I caught a ride from El Paso into LA to the United We Stand Festival. So check a little bit of that. My last part of Texas and into LA.
you win some, sometimes you stay on the side of the road. I am ready to get the fuck on and out of Texas. Texas, why? sing songs when I change tires cause I got nothing to do but sit here and play with wires, motherfucker. Yeah, Neo, feel free to not show anybody this shit. Or at least the singing part. If you think people want to see me change a tire, I did this. That's how you fix a fucking tire on the side of the road with cars going by at 90 miles an hour. Peace. And told us to be the change we wish to see in the world. Freedom's calling, I feel the fire that's deep inside us Everybody wants change, but tell me who will guide us To the leaders that pass away, put up your lighters It's a beautiful struggle, but it cannot divide us We're the warriors that we've always been waiting for See yourself in the mirror and open up the door Walk through it and feel the love throughout your pores Be the light, life's purpose is to feel joy Metaphysical, lyrical, standing up for truth The only one to make change is walking in your shoes Be the example, don't complain about the news Make your music and serving the world with the loot Now you can be the same, or you can be the change, find strength from inside, break through the chains, no one to blame, nothing to prove, you create your reality, it's up to you, be the change, that you wanna see in the world, like I need live for peace, a spider beast, so I'm on the fight for the beliefs, like Martin Luther King, a spider beast, of that love, that light, like Christ, it's like for the moment in need, and if you believe, in Jehovah, Allah, Buddha, Christians love. To me. My soul yearns for peace in a world that's flooded with war. History's littered with body scar trying to say. Osana, that's a sauna, Graham, I've been fond of phonics. It's ironic, even as an embryonic. Fit the way in biblical, don't that sound biblical? I've been a terror since I tarried that of the uterus. Evil plans are made to the feet. We've got a positive story, a victory this past week in Detroit. Awesome work done by community members in Detroit and activists from around the nation who have gone out there to fight the city shutting off water to tens and thousands of people since March. This past Monday, the uh, Detroit Water and Sewer Sewage Department said that they're gonna halt the water shutoffs for 15 days. So today, you should be watching this on maybe a Sunday or a Monday. That gives them one more week for the people to keep fighting this. The department said that they're gonna give the community more time to figure out how to deal with the water shutoffs and to come up with funds. Of course, as many of you may have heard, that the people are having their water shut off because the city's bankrupt and there's plenty of you know people who are without income or have very little income. And while corporations and others who are in debt to the city continue to have water flowing, the city has decided to shut off the power, the water to the remaining people in there. But once again, we see in Detroit, the community thriving in the absence of government, or at least in the face of a very weakened government, weakened police department. We have institutions such as Detroit Threat Management that we talked about a couple weeks ago. We have community gardens thriving everywhere. 
We've got uh, independent bus services popping up. People are coming together voluntarily and organizing because they're not just going to give up just because there's no government. They're going to get stronger and Detroit will revive and will thrive. So awesome work to everybody out there who's been fighting the water shutoffs. And on that note, if you are interested in helping us get out there, myself and some members of the Conscious Resistance team are trying to get to Detroit in mid-August so we can go out there and report on the water situation, we can show you the community gardens, we can show you how people are organizing without the police, and show you all these awesome stories of community coming together. If you're interested in helping out with that, please check our Indiegogo campaign below in the link. We've only got a few more days left and any help is appreciated. This week I stumbled into a story that detailed how flotation tanks, also known as sensory deprivation tanks, isolation tanks, can be useful and helpful towards veterans dealing with PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. The story took a look at a specific soldier who's come back and been using the flotation tanks, which basically, if you've never seen them before, there's various kinds, but these, these debuted in the 1950s. Look up John C. Lilly and his work. Look up The Eye of the Cyclone, Into the Eye of the Cyclone, something like that. Really awesome book that I found while I was in jail. It details his experiments into LSD and flotation tanks, um, all these type of things. And I know that some of you have heard, heard of them from Joe Rogan, but if you haven't heard of them, basically what it involves is going inside a device where you're suspended, um, floating in salt water. Now some of the older ones, it was like a full, a full room size where you would basically be submerged in there completely and it's supposed to be, you know, dark, you can't hear anything, you can't see anything, and you just float there. And it's just another form of meditation. You guys have heard me talk about meditation and how, how helpful that can be. Well, here you go. Here's another way for you to do this if you're not the kind of person that's going to sit against the wall and stare at it for 10 to 15 minutes a day. Try this out. So some studies have found that flotation tanks, isolation tanks are helpful with reducing stress, anxiety, and depression. And these are all symptoms that affect uh, veterans with PTSD. So people have a lot of anger issues, they're stressed out, they're falling apart, they're on all those psychotropic drugs, veterans are committing suicide every single day, and then they decide to go lay into a tub full of salt water. And they have experiences, things are revealed to themselves. Maybe, you know, some people describe having deeply um, spiritual experiences, things coming back to them in their mind that they weren't even aware of, that they had blocked out, having really healing experiences and powerful experiences. I myself have yet to try a flotation uh, tank, an isolation tank, sensory deprivation tank, but I definitely plan to from my own work with meditation and other forms. I do not doubt for an instance that these things can be very helpful. There's also another study that came out last year showing that MDMA, methyl methamphetamine, also known as ecstasy, can be helpful for veterans who are dealing with PTSD. And I know, I know you're saying like, wait, wait, should we just give these veterans a bunch of ecstasy? Do I need to go hit the club and buy them some X and then come back and help my brother who's all stressed out from the war? Probably not. But if you know a little bit of the history of MDMA in the 80s and the 70s when it was first developed and brought more into the mainstream, uh, psychologists, therapists were using it to test people who had alcoholism and a number of different things. You know, there, there used to be a legitimate use of psychedelics in therapy. They understood this. Thankfully, things like this are coming back. Alternative holistic treatments such as flotation devices, um, psilocybin, LSD, MDMA, in controlled settings in the right environment with the right mindset are coming back. And these people who are dealing with traumatic syndromes uh, like PTSD and whether or not you've gone to war or not. I've talked about this before. We've all dealt with some crazy things in our life because of the type of world we're living in. So maybe we could all use a little bit more time floating in a tank. Whee! So that's it for tonight. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Please do check out theconsciousresistance.com every single week. My show is here Sunday nights and then Monday nights on Voluntary Virtues Network. we have putting out new articles and new videos from Katie Chaos, myself, uh, John Vibes writing articles, and we're looking for more people to contribute to the team. This is not an elite team on the Conscious Resistance Network. You guys are more than welcome to come sign up for free to join and to submit your content. We want to put out content that is um, empowering, that is inspiring, that gets you thinking about politics, about government, about self-rule, about anarchy, about spirituality, about consciousness. If you can write and think about topics anywhere in that area, send, us, send it to us. We'll put it up on the website, help you get your work out there. Our goal and my personal goal is to continue to grow as an activist, as a journalist, and as a human being. And in that process, if I can give anybody else a tool to use 
uh, for their voice and to grow their voice, then that's what we want to do. And that's what we're all about, the conscious resistance. So thank you guys for tuning in. Please be sure to give this video a thumbs up, uh, subscribe to the channel, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and uh, we'll be back next week. Thank you guys for your time. As always, if you can hear this, you are the resistance. Peace. Flag code? Don't fly the flag upside down. Please don't grab anything for me, man. They don't have to do that. Don't fly. Have you ever heard of the United States flag? Yeah. Code? Do you yeah, know why the flag's illegal. flown upside down? It's illegal to fly. Do you know like why that. the flag's flown upside down? Why is it?